Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion. You can tell from the title up there. It's another horror-related movie review. And it's another from the first cycle of Universal's horror films. And fitting enough, this is also the last entry in the first cycle. This course is a vampire film I've always been curious to watch, along with the last one you saw me review. I just hadn't gone around to it. Kind of interesting that I watched some in a reverse order, but and that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. It, of course, is Dracula's Daughter. One of the few direct sequels that doesn't have a lot of big continuity things. Because, as I've mentioned time and again, when it comes to the sequels released in the second half of the Universal Monster Cycle, there's always, like, continuity things where you're, like, looking at it like, wait a minute. Which is why I think James Rolfe put it best when he described the sequels in that era, where they're half sequels, half reboots. Where there's some connection, but then there's a lot of it, eh. Yeah. This one, it picks up right where Dracula left off, so it really does continue the story, even though it doesn't really draw much from the source material other than the basic setting, and that is more drawing from the adaptation that Universal did and what left of the source material is there. Now, the film is directed by Lambert Hillier, who also directed The Invisible Ray, which, of course, had Bela Lugosi in it, and the Batman serial from 1943. So there's bats everywhere with this guy. And Lambert, his direction for this film is pretty decent. I mean, it's not as good as some of the other Universal directors, but it definitely has an eerie quality at times. And uh, he was quite the trooper because on the ninth day of production, he was injured when a freestanding fill lamp fell. Uh, the screenplay was written by Garrett Fort, who also wrote uh, another favorite from my childhood, The Mark of Zorro. Uh, he also wrote Frankenstein, the, that one. And he also wrote the, the first Dracula, but there is that little post note that it was the play script, so I'm uh, guessing that means he wrote the original script and then they took that and added some more stuff to make it more cinematic. So it is also fitting they get the original writer back for it, too. And, of course, Garrett had a tough job here because he was still writing the script or going through draft after draft when they started filming. It wasn't until some time into production that a finished script was there. And I'm not going to have to sh lie and sugarcoat it. You can kind of tell a little bit with the film that they did kind of start it without it being finished. There's like some parts of it that feel that way. I think it's kind of balanced with a little bit of Lambert's atmosphere. And of course, Gloria Holden playing Countess Maria Zelensky, the titular Dracula's daughter. There's just something about her. There's a timeless, eerie quality about her. Her presence is not the same level as, say, Lugosi's in the first film, which really does help carry that film, because as I've said time and again, just from a filmmaking standpoint, I think the Spanish one is better, but the English one, you got Lugosi as Dracula, and of course you got Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing, which he returns in this film as Van Helsing. Like I said, it picks up really right where the first one set off, but Gloria, she does have that eerie quality about her, and going with the story they go with really does make you feel for the character. Now, the plot of the film is it literally picks up right where the first one ended, where Dracula's been staked, Van Helsing is there, and then the cops show up. Although it's like, who the heck called the cops? I, mean, I know it's been a while since I watched the first film, but I don't remember them calling the cops, unless it's some local guy called the cops, like, yeah, you know, you need to go up there. Huh? Yeah, there's something going up up there. You need to go up there, cops. Something weird like that, probably. They show up, they find... The body of Renfield, although this is probably one of the few little continuity things with the film that I was watching. I was going, wait a minute. Why would his body be there? I remember being in a different staircase. It just it just got me like, okay, that's weird, but okay. Been a couple years. People weren't as iffy on continuity back then when it comes to films as they are now. So it's one of those things like, yeah, for the time period, let it slide. They find Van Helsing. They find the body of Dracula. And, of course, they do the sensible thing that most people would do, and that's arrest Van Helsing for murder. But Van Helsing is like, I cannot be accused of murder if the man who I killed has not been alive for 500 years. Going with the whole vampire card, and, of course, everyone's doing the same song and dance. Vampire! Psh, 
there's no such thing as vampires. But Van Sloan stands his ground, and instead of a lawyer, he requests the help of a psychiatrist, his old student, Jeffrey Garth, played by Otto Kruger. Kruger, yes. <laughs> Another little horror connection there. Now, as they're going through that, Countess Maria Zelensky, or excuse me, Maria, excuse me, Countess Zelensky, I'm just going to say that, so it's easier to pronounce. She shows up, and using some vampire pish posh, she manages to claim the body of her father, and gives it a ceremonial send-off. Now, as we find out, the reason for her doing this is that she feels now that her father is dead, having him laid to the rest, her vampireness should go. Now, it doesn't, and part of the scope of the film is her trying to overcome her vampiric nature. Which, when you think about it, for a vampire film made this early in the golden age of cinema is very forward-thinking. Because most of the time, at least that I can think of off the top of my head, when vampires are in films... There's you, at this point, they're all basically monsters. Different levels. Some are just outright full ghouls. Other ones are monsters with a charm to them, like Lugosi and other ones that spring from that. But to have one that is well aware of her vampiric nature and trying to overcome it, even though it doesn't really work in the end, it kind of is a bittersweet ending. But to try that, especially have it being played by a woman... With another little caveat I'm about to mention in a minute. Very forward and progressive for 1936. Now, as the film goes on, you can tell that it's not working. Her whole first thought about Dracula being dead and now her nature no longer having to be there or be overcome doesn't work. So she starts enlisting the help of Garth because she senses there's something about him. They never really pinpoint what it is. There's just something about him. So she's probably just drawn to him. It could be her vampiric nature still playing up. And her his blood, his humanness is, being a tr is basically pulling up a big beacon to her vampiric nature. Kind of like how certain foods make us more attractive to mosquitoes, for lack of a better comparison. And of course this makes her human familiar... Sandor, played by Irving Pitchell, a little jealous because she had said he was going to be turned. Although you could fool me with how the makeup is on Irving. He kind of already looks like he might have been turned, but I think they're trying to go with the whole big thug type familiar with him. I actually at first thought he was a vampire until they cleared that up in dialogue. I'm like, oh, he's not one yet. Could have fooled me. Uh, now, near the end, of course... Zelensky does and meet her end and it's all because of her trying to turn Garth, Xandor being mad and a nice little love triangle thing going on there. Although they never do use that type of thing so it's not quite clear if it's romantic interest or if it's just lust driven by the Countess's vampiric nature which of course if that's the case you could tie that into another little bit of uh, vampirism being a metaphor for sex and uh, other stuff like that. Now, while she's doing this, there is a moment where, in order to overcome her urge, Zelensky is going to do some painting. Now, Sandor does go out and get her a female model who seems to be down on her luck and about to contemplate suicide. And the way they set it up, you're like, wow, is she really going to do that? Now, for the 30s, this would have been like, oh my god. Nowadays, very tame. Especially, and then what's in the next scene is also tame by today's standards, but when you look at it through the lens of the 30s, the decade where people a couple years after this would be like, oh, did he just say, I cannot believe he would use such vile language to, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, then it makes sense. That, of course, is the subtle lesbianism hinted at in the way that the Countess and her model interact in it, especially with the Countess having her kind of do like a topless thing. And of course it's a topless for the 30s, so it is very tame. It's more the hint of nudity without actually seeing any of the exposed bits. Kind of like the implication, the same type of thing that Hitchcock would use in Psycho. 
and I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, this is a little getting a little racy for 36. I wasn't expecting this. I knew about this moment coming, and I just didn't know how they would achieve it. And watching it, I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty good, this part. And I'm like, I can kind of see why people back in the 30s got uptight about it, but also, it's like, wow, they got uptight over this. But I shouldn't be surprised, because this is the same point in time where they started to implement the codes when it comes to these films, which is why when they released... Dracula and Frankenstein, some parts are edited out, like Frankenstein, the shot of the plunger going in was edited out. And of course, tampering with the infamous, it's a live one because it's sacrilegious. Oh, heaven forbid the people who are uber religious like that, if they don't want to hear sacrilege, they just don't watch the movie. Oh no. But going back onto it, it does make that scene work. It does play into the Countess's overall plot thing. And with how the film ends, we find out she's just like her dad. She has been dead for hundreds of years, so she's not like someone that he turned and is hoping that it reverts to normal, but no. Nope. So that's why I say it ends on a bittersweet note. I'm not going to give a note for no spoiler other than that she does die, but it is bittersweet. And I'll say overall, I felt for her more than I did for Dracula and Son of Dracula. And I think part of that was... Gloria really feels like she was meant to play the Countess, whereas I'm, like I mentioned in my Son of Dracula review, even though Lon Chaney is great as the Wolfman, all right as Frankenstein until the third act, and decent as the Mummy, even though he has nothing to do other than body language, that's the one I feel he was really miscast in, and I still stand by that, especially more after seeing this film finally. And it just overall, the plot just dro engages me more, maybe because it actually is a more interesting sequel. Now, the whole thing involving how she is his daughter, they never really answer. We know from the first film he does have wives, even though in the course of the films they never really address them as the brides of Dracula. So we can guess that maybe he had them with her, especially because of the age difference between when Dracula died and when she died. It could be that they're using daughter in a more metaphysical sense, considering that she has a different last name. Of course, you could always say that that's her rebelling against her dad, but I'd say that it's more the fact that he's the one that turned her. She's from a similar region, knew of him, and that because she knew of him and all that, which is why she does that little ritual thing at the beginning to try to see if that undoes her curse, but no. And how and why she was turned by him, that's really speculation there, but probably, you know, invited him into it, her house, was sucked the blood eventually, and because of that, she became bound to him in a way, even if it just loosely because of the fact that he was the one that turned her. And he didn't turn her into a bride, maybe because she was too strong-willed, maybe because of some other thing, but somehow she became his metaphysical daughter because of how he's the one that turned her. Just a lot of stuff like that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is the last film in the first cycle. Now, part of that was that it went over budget seven days and cost 50000 more. And this was already an expensive film even before that, but that pushed it to just a little bit over a quarter million dollars, which, think about it, for the 30s, quarter million dollars. Now, I say that even though this is the same era that we got Gone with the Wind, which I've already mentioned, and of course The Wizard of Oz. But that was a couple years later. That was when the Hollywood income was really riding high. And of course we saw that when, with the first film in the Universal Cycle Part 2, which was Son of Frankenstein with the lavish sets. Here we didn't really get that. Here you could definitely tell they're using a lot of the same sets. And it's mainly the film, probably some of the actors, and maybe the fact that they had to reshoot a couple stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if they did because of the fact they didn't have a finished script. But back then, I don't think they were as conf con you know, going with reshoots as they are now. Now, anyway, because of those budgets being pushed over and all that, I am not surprised that four days after they finished filming, Universal's principal creditor, Standard Capital Core, seized control of the studio from the Lamell family, including the patriarch, Carl Lamell, the founder, and they kicked him out. It's a sad thing about it, though. Whenever there's money involved, eventually people are going to get kicked out. 
And after this, Universal was full corporate, no longer like the family structured business that it had been before. And when you look at how the films of the first half of the Universal Monster Cycle and the second half are structured, you can really tell that the second half they're really made more as cash grabs. Not to say that a lot of them are bad, even though there's still a lot in that second half I still need to watch, especially a lot of the sequels to ones from the first one. But if you look at it, especially with how the sequels are, so not you can kind of tell. I mean, a lot of the Mummy sequels, more action adventure even though they are entertaining, definitely a step down in, from the eerie atmosphere of the first one. Son of Dracula, I've already touched on. And even though I haven't seen them, the House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein. And of course, even though I do like it, even Ghost of Frankenstein, you can look at it. Wolfman is an exception there, because it's still excellent. Now, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, also good. That one you can definitely tell was made to big cash grab, and that was the beginning of the monster mash that we saw throughout the rest of the Universal series that, of course, ended, depending how you look at it, with Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. No, not the mummy. Meet Frankenstein. Meet the mummy, probably. You could say that, but that's way after it. And then with the first one, of course, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, amongst others, and there's still a lot in that first half I need to see, but... You can definitely tell it was more for art for art's sake in the first half with the money also being there. Especially with The Bride of Frankenstein. That one's really artsy when compared to the first one. Second one, more about the money. And the Lamelles not being there. Definitely can see that's part of the reason. There's not really much else to touch on on this film. And like I mentioned, Lambert does a decent job directing. Gloria's excellent as a countess. Uh, the rest of the crew do a pretty good job. I mean... Edward is still good as Van Helsing, he just doesn't have a lot to do when compared to the first one. Maybe because he's mainly in jail for most of the film. But he does have a couple good bits of dialogue at the end once the Countess is dead. So there's that. And it's not really much else to say. Definitely comes with my recommendation if you have not seen it and you've always been curious. Especially if you've heard about that moment I already touched on. It is on Peacock right now if you have that. If not, and you happen to have the Dracula box set like I do over there, definitely worth popping in. I definitely see myself one of these days watching all of them in a row and seeing how they play back to back. Or actually getting all the Universal films right now, the timeline, and watching them in production order. I know that would be interesting to watch a little classic Universal Monster Marathon. Well, until next time, guys.